thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Um, we're thrilled to welcome you to our first panel of a series of Valpo at Work panels during the month of April. Uh, tonight, we're joined by three professionals who have taken different paths, obviously, to, to get to their current roles. And um, they're going to tell you a little bit about their background. Uh, but I just want to introduce each by, by name and, and title and employer. First, Jeff Gilmore. He's Chief Operating Officer and Executive Vice President at Worthington Industries in Columbus, Ohio. Adeline Medina is a Sales Finance Senior Analyst at PepsiCo in Chicago. And Zach Labar is Regional Fleet Sales Manager for the West and Southwest regions at Valpo, at Valpo, at v Volvo Group, excuse me, uh, in Denver, Colorado. Um, and they'll tell you a little bit more about their backgrounds as they go. But uh, thank you for taking the time to join us. Feel free to use the chat box, students, to ask questions of the guests, please. Uh, we'll get through them throughout the program. We're not going to wait till the end to answer questions. We want this to be a dialogue, Q&A, back and forth. Panelists know they can kind of feed off each other a little bit, back and forth, uh, as it seems appropriate. Um, as I mentioned to the panelists, students, no topics are off limits. Feel free to ask questions about anything that's uh, professional or maybe even of a personal nature as it relates to their career and their lives after Valpo. Um, the program is uh, being recorded, so you'll be able to replay it uh, on the Career Center YouTube channel. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Musa Pinar, marketing professor over in the College of Business, and Musa is going to moderate tonight's session. Musa, take it away. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Sure. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Jeff, Zach, and uh, Adeline. Is that, is that correct, Adeline? Yep, that's right. Okay. Uh, we are happy to have you guys here, and I teach sales class. And when I heard the sales uh, panel, I said, "Oh, that's great!" Uh, and would like for you to uh, tell us about yourself a little bit and, and your career path, taking you to sales, and, and any, any anything that you'd like to share with the students. Uh, Who would like to start? Maybe start Jeff. Yep, I'd be happy to. So, um, just a little. Background, uh, Jeff Gilmore, and I'm married to my wife, Erica, have three kids, 14, 12, and seven. And uh, as mentioned, I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Worthington Industries, and we're headquartered in Columbus, Ohio. A little bit about my career path, you know, first of all, graduated from Valparaiso University. And I think like many, you know, students or, or young adults graduating, I had a sociology major and realized that is not the career I was gonna pursue. Um, and I wasn't quite certain where my passion was at that time, I was 22 years old. But what I did know is um, I was a competitive person. Um, I liked helping, I liked interacting and getting to know people. And I was very interested in business. I think I always had somewhat of an entrepreneurial spirit. And as I started looking for opportunities, it just seemed that sales, inside sales or outside um, were the, the best opportunities or there were the most opportunities. So that's really what led me to sales. So I started off in inside sales uh, with Worthington Industries, eventually progressed into uh, outside sales or a territory manager position, moved into a regional manager position to director of our automotive sales. And then we'll talk a little bit more about this, I think as the, as the panel moves on, what commercial sales can expose you to but I actually made a jump to, uh, to operations on to become a general manager into uh, a vice president of purchasing role for Worthington Industries and price risk management. And then ultimately became a, a president of Worthington Steel on to president of Worthington Cylinders and then into my current role. So I don't know if anybody counted, but there was a lot of moves along the way and a lot of different opportunities. Uh, but that's how I got into sales originally. Um, Adelina, why don't you share your, uh, I guess, background and your career uh, path? All right. So um, I ended up going to DePaul University, so I'm not a Valpo grad, but um, following DePaul, I ended up at PepsiCo, where I took a finance role, and I've had various finance and accounting roles 
right now I'm not technically in a sales role, but I do partner and support sales in a sales finance role. And it's just a critical role in understanding the business because we're such a sales oriented, sales driven organization. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, Zach, uh, I had you in my uh, two classes, one in person, one online when you were in, in Germany. And it's nice to see you. Uh, tell us about your career path and, and other things that you can share with the students. Thank you, Professor. So I'm Zach Labar. Um, I work in sales currently. I am the uh, regional manager for the Southwest and the West and selling um, capital equipment to large companies. Um, so a little bit about, I guess, my story uh, is I started in the industry at Valparaiso University. I ended up taking an internship with Cummins Inc. Um, out of Columbus, Indiana. And I was down there for about a summer. And uh, my path was a little bit different because I was planning on going to law school. Uh, the challenge that I had uh, in coming out of undergrad or the period that we were going through undergrad was that we had to deal with a, an economic recession. So a lot of friends of mine were going to law school. A lot of people I knew were going into, uh, uh, were going into grad school uh, to kind of further their education and put off, um, put off working um, until the job market sort of recovered. So at that time, I had uh, taken on a, a full-time role with Cummins um, because there, there just was that opportunity and I figured might as well. And uh, if I don't like it, then I'll move on into something else. But it was interesting because when I started, um, it was a supplier quality improvement engineering role. Um, but as a part of that uh, summer session that I had, I was actually visiting a supplier. Uh, and when I visited that supplier, uh, you know, we took them out to lunch, you know, it was really like a face to face interaction type thing. And um, being a, a person that enjoys relationships uh, and not being behind a computer all day, I decided that I would like to, to find a role into more of a, a customer interfacing um, type job. So long story short, got in with Cummins, worked at, worked at Cummins for about four years, um, have stayed in the industry, moved on to Allison Transmissions uh, and moved out to the East Coast. Um, and then from there, I had taken a, a role into product management, uh, which had sent me abroad quite a bit. Um, the company was based out of Virginia, but I was in and out of Germany and Portugal pretty extensively with our manufacturing facilities there. I then moved back to Cummins in a startup capacity. Um, they had started a, a digital uh, ventures company um, at Indianapolis and they asked me to support the East Coast sales uh, division. So I was with that company for about a year and a half and then the cyclical downturn of the, the business, the trucking business at the end of 18, um, they decided to divest us. So I had ended up in 2019 um, just after the new year, joining the Volvo Group, working in national accounts. So calling on the largest customers from the Volvo Group in North America, um, some of the most notable ones being um, Amazon. So we were a part of the commercial team that got Amazon their first semis, uh, which is a, a pretty interesting venture in its own. Um, but I had recently taken on a new role in, in selling uh, trucks for the Mac brand, which is a Volvo Group brand um, in the Southwest and West. So very exciting. I've moved a lot. Um, I was in Nashville, Indianapolis, Grand Rapids, Michigan, Charlottesville, Virginia, um, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and now Denver, Colorado, uh, to hopefully call home for a good period of time. So um, but that's a little bit about my story. I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more. Uh, it's good to see Jeff here. Jeff, I does Brandon McPherson happen to work for Worthington? Uh, yes. A basketball player? Yes. Yeah, so Brandon obviously was a basketball player at Valparaiso. And uh, a friend of his actually reached out directly to me, not Brandon, um, but I was connected with Brandon. And then I actually called his coach at the time, which was Bryce Drew yep. and asked about Brandon and what he thought. And he, he obviously had glowing remarks. So we did bring Brandon in and he is started out in inside sales, went through our training program and he's doing an awesome job in outside sales right now. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, was a great guy. Je uh, he's, he's, a, he's a great guy. Obviously, back in my college days, I got to know Brandon. I'm sure a lot of the, the, the panel knows Brandon just from his playing days under Bryce Drew. So I was just curious. But that's great to hear. And you, you aren't you going to give Musa the full credit for you going into sales, though? <laughs> well, he was teaching marketing at the time. So, right. uh, you know, the two classes I had for marketing uh, were, were challenging classes. But uh, you know, my home was getting in front of customers and uh, and having that rapport and building that rapport. So 
and also being a competitive person, as you had mentioned, I mean, uh, you know, transitioning from being an athlete into something like sales is, is, a, is really a good fit. Uh, but what, what I've come to find out is there's many different roles within sales that, you know, you can be a farmer, you can be a hunter, you know, so it really just depends. But uh, I could credit uh, Professor Pinar for that. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you one thing that you, that you said, I mean, that you, you definitely get an opportunity, I think, in, in sales and, and more specifically outside sales or sales management is I also had the opportunity to move uh, around a lot at a, a young age. I mean, I was in Indiana. Ohio, Mississippi, Iowa, Tennessee, and, and back to Ohio. And that was just a really fun, great experience early on to move around. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I had the opportunity to move quite a bit, um, you know, and see a lot. I mean, you know, I, it, you know, it is what it is, right. You can, you can be home a lot, you know, if you like the area that you live in, I lived out of a suitcase for many years. So sales isn't for everybody, you know, it's for a certain, I guess, person that enjoys that type of thing. But uh, as I've gotten more, I guess, senior in my roles and senior, uh, you know, through the, uh, I guess, maturing uh, to a point, I've, I've really come to enjoy uh, sales, especially in a COVID environment, because you don't realize how often you're home and how much life has changed, uh, you know, just, uh, just having to sit behind a computer all day. It's kind of left doing those types of roles. So well said. Jeff, when, I was, when he was here, I wasn't teaching sales. There was a, a professor, uh, Fred Langer, he was teaching, he probably he was here, but you didn't do a business major. Uh, he was teaching sales, he retired. And I used to teach sales when I was at St. Joseph's College down the road, uh, 90s. And I just said, I wanna go into sales teaching area. And then I have, we in, in my sales class, let me give you a little idea. Uh, we do a role playing, videotaping, they had to, watch their role play and critique themselves. So these are little things I have been doing in the, in the sales class, but I'll let you guys share your sales experiences. Uh, Adeline, don't stay out there if you're not sales, but you can contribute. You can you can have an impact. I'm sure you have an impact on the salespeople who, uh, for what you do. Don't be shy to make sure everybody knows you make us smarter. <laughs> I wouldn't say smarter, just better choices. <laughs> <laughs> you you and the, the you guys can share your um, experiences in a way that the the the, the, the some of the key things that that you learn you gain over the years uh, as you you change the sales uh, jobs or move through the sales career so students can can get some of the skills some of the challenges. Uh, I know I always he read that rejection is a major thing in the sales area, overcoming that rejection thing there. So anything that you have gained over the years, please share uh, with the students. I'm sure they will benefit from that. Well, I mean, for, for starters, I just think what, what I probably gained the most was just simply overall business acumen. As I look back over my career, I feel very fortunate that I started out um, in sales. And, you know, in sales, you're dealing with the customer and the customer is what drives the demand. So we'll always say the customer is the most important thing, but it's, it's dealing with the customers on the front line where, you know, of course you're trying to sell them a, a product, but you're also trying to differentiate. You're also trying to make sure that your delivery performance is good, quality is good. So the exposure that I got to a very young age to various departments within the, in the company, I, I felt like I was getting kind of a, a I'll call it a mini MBA on the, on, the, on the spot. And because you're dealing with all those different issues, whether it's again, inventory operations and should you add capacity or should you not? Um, is there a supply chain issue? And where is that? Is that within your organization or is that somebody you're buying from raw materials? you're having to get involved and help your customer with all those problem solving. And so I think that certainly then set me up later to move into some of those other roles that I talked about and do it maybe uh, more seamlessly. And, and then ultimately getting into a role where I was leading a, leading a P&L, which is what I aspired to do early on. So again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak selfishly. I just felt like I don't see that many roles even today in the organization where I'm, 
I'm looking over everything uh, where you're going to get that much exposure to so many different departments early on. So yeah, sales, in my opinion, um, you know, it, it really is, it's a skill. And, you know, what, what you come to find is that, you know, coming out of college and, and trying to figure out your path, you know, I had friends going to Wall Street. I had friends, you know, go on to law school, go into business school right away, go to work in tech. There's not a lot of vanity that you can tell right around sales to begin with. You know, it's not given the greatest name that's out there. But when you get into it and you realize, you know, to Jeff's point, you know, all the things that it teaches you, right? It, te it teaches you to deal with customers that are very upset. Uh, there's not a lot of people that can deal with people yelling at you all day. Uh, and sometimes in sales, that's what you have to deal with. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of people that can sometimes deal with the travel that might be involved in, in sales. And uh, like I said, so it teaches you a lot of different skills. It really teaches you a way to, um, to at least manage your time and manage it effectively. And also, you know, how to farm and how to hunt. I mean, it, it really is a well-rounded way to, to understand the business. And you know, as Jeff has done it, you know, through his career, kind of moving up through, uh, you know, managing a PL, seeing different parts of the business. I mean, it really gives you a fundamental understanding on what the business is there for, which is, uh, you know, pro providing products and services to customers. So um, I've enjoyed my career. Uh, it's been fantastic. Um, you know, I've had a lot of opportunity to meet a lot of really good people. And, you know, at the level that I deal in sales now, um, you know, you're dealing with complex buyers. So, you know, I work with, you know, Adeline's company, uh, you know, at least the parent company. I mean, you're dealing with some really senior, fantastic procurement folks that understand their business through and through. And the only way that you can sell to a business like that is you have to understand their business. You have to understand their needs. And then you have to obviously execute uh, and being a competitive person and being a good salesperson. That's what it's going to take to be successful. So, um, but when you deal with multi, a lot of these larger companies and dealing with, uh, you know, the, the prospect of, of actually selling them a product or a service, you're dealing with some of the best in the world. I mean, Amazon, uh, you know, there's some that I've dealt with, PepsiCo, uh, JB Hunt, Knight Swift. I mean, some of these are the largest companies in the world uh, and keep the, keep the world going uh, through transportation. So dealing with those complex buyers, uh, you know, really gives you a, a strong understanding of, of how the world works. Angeline, let's hear about your career challenges, things you've faced. Yeah, so I just saw this question come in from Joe about, I feel like sales can have a bad rep sometimes thinking of pushy car salesmen and how did that affect your view of sales? And I definitely can relate to that because I was very scared to go into this sales finance role. I was like, these salespeople are going to be so pushy and, you know, it's going to be really hard to work with them and they're going to be very demanding and not care about my time or my calendar. Um, and what I've seen, especially right now with like all these COVID trends and, you know, running into the supply chain issues of people, you know, filling up in March last year and, and taking all this Gatorade and running out of products and stuff like that. The salespeople just do a really good job at partnering with you because you we want the same thing, right? We want Gatorade to win. And then they also have the difficulty of going to the customer and talking through some of the pricing changes that we're going that we're going to implement and everything. So it's really de like definitely changed my perspective that I have on with these salespeople like I don't know how you guys do it all, but you are able to wear multiple hats and just get through everything. It's, it's impressive. And I saw that question as well. I think just in, the, in addition to what you're saying, and, and I, I thought that early on, I thought of the pushy you know, car salesman to use the, the, the words from the, the question. And, and the fact is that's just really not what business to business sales is. And, and, and that's what I've done. You are really, these customers have, have a need and, and they want to see you and they want to understand your solutions and you know, how that can address their needs. You're helping them with, with cost savings. And I think you know, good salespeople do the things that I just described. And more often than not, your customers see you as an extension of their business if, if you're managing that properly. So I think, you know, again, there's that stereotype of, of pushing this and, and certainly you're gonna be working against competitors, but I really you know, found a lot of, found it very gratifying to provide a solution again, or some 
you know, major cost savings initiative that truly was going to help that customer out. There's a lot more to it than just the, you know, the, the push for the sale, I guess. Yeah, and, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll agree with that. I mean, I, I came out of, uh, you know, it was my uh, six months before I graduated. I got a job offer from Cummins as a sales guy and I was looking at it and I'm like, man, am I going to be this greasy sales guy? You know, I, I didn't have any idea at the time that uh, again, there's, there's not a lot of vanity behind it unless you actually know the industry and know the business to business sales. It's funny because I, I went to Professor LeClear and Professor Stook and I said, hey, you know, what do you think? You know, I'm about to come out of, of undergrad, you know, dealing with the, the worst economic recession that's hit since COVID. You know, what do I do? You know, should I just go on to grad school or should I you know, really look at this offer? Because it's kind of, you know, it's sales, you know, it's kind of sounds kind of greasy. Am I selling watches? you know, on a street corner. It just, it just didn't make a lot of sense to me, but, you know, they both had talked me off the ledge. They said, this is a fantastic company. You know, Cummins is a, a, a large, large company out of Indiana. It's a, it's a great company and it's business to business sales as Jeff had, Jeff had mentioned. So uh, it, it really, you know, it, it really sometimes comes off that way. If you're, if you're not involved in the business or understand sales as much, but you know, some of the best employees out there are, are sales guys and they bring and they bring rain, they bring revenue for companies and uh, they're invaluable. So, you know, I, I did see I think, go ahead, Adeline. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say that um, I think Zach pointed to this earlier is the idea of you building a relationship. And I think it's important for salespeople to not look at them as like used car salesmen. There's this, I forgot what he said, but um as really like relationship he said greasy builders. a few times. <laughs> I forgot what he said exactly. But yeah, I greasy know. salesman. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great point because it's not it's not transactional, right? I mean, most right. my sales cycle and probably Jeff's the same way. My sales cycle is a year long. You know, you have to deal with these people for a year. You know, because they're dealing with budgets. They're publicly traded companies. I mean, it's just the natural progression of the business. So you know. You're, you're dealing with people, you're having relationships. And I, what I would say is that most people at that level in other companies aren't going to be dealing with a sleazy sales guy. They're going to be dealing with an actual, you know, a, an actual professional that's trying to bring them a service or good that's going to benefit their business. Or like Jeff had mentioned, that's going to save them money. Zach, that's, that is a great point. I mean, Adeline said the relationships, but you're right. This generally business to business, these are long sales cycles. So you're building relationships, you're building up trust and, and, and often quite frankly, long-term friendships um, out of these relationships, so. Zach, how did, did you say you, you sold uh, through Amazon? Tell us how you can sell truck through Amazon. <laughs> that's, that's yeah, well, we sold, sold trucks to Amazon. Yeah, so Amazon decided to start their own trucking company. Um, and they, uh, you know, they, they've realized that their need for their business, they, they can't contract out enough, uh, you know, for, for trucking around the country on top of, um, you know, that they have quality standards that they need to meet. So they had thought that they would just go ahead and start a business. So they're the largest startup trucking company uh, on the planet. Um, we sold them initially, I think, 600 or 700 semis. Um, and then they bought another 500 from a, a competitor of ours, PACAR. Um, they had then channel shifted into doing natural gas motors due to the, uh, the, the climate accord. Um, they're going to move to being uh, more carbon neutral. So they moved from diesel to natural gas, and now they're going to be moving into fully electric trucks. So um, we're lucky as a commercial team, I was working on the part side of the business when we had, when we had executed that with them, but they're going to be, they're probably going to be the largest trucking company in the world before long. Um, but it, a, any idea of their volumes, they could, they could, literally use all of the volume of FedEx and all the volume of UPS and still need trucking companies to help support them. So. I did see a question on, in, in a nutshell, how do you deal with reject? And, and did, did you have customers turn you away? And, you know, of course um, that's going to come with sales. And yes, I did experience you know, calling on customers and, and initially they did not want to use our company or they felt that they were comfortable uh, with the supplier that they had. And, 
you know, it's just dealing with that is, is, is remaining professional and, and respecting where they're at. But I think, you know, I just always try to make a, a point of making it clear if, if things have changed, um, please, you know, let me be the one that you reach out to, to have a conversation and, and see if we can help you. And, it, and often somebody does fall down and that, that does create an opportunity, but, you know, reject or, or no initially is going to be, you know, part of the territory. But I think, you know, Zach, we both mentioned it. That's where the competitiveness, I think you need to, you need to stay the course and that's touching base, you know, every three months or so. Uh, what it is not is um, stalking the potential customer and hassling them every other day. So I think you just got to read the, read the cues and you have to be patient, um, but at the same time, stay determined. Yeah. I mean, rejection is just a part of the business, um, you know, and, and again, since these are longstanding relationships, you're going to get another opportunity, you know, and that's kind of, that's kind of the, the, you know, the difficulty when you're dealing with, um, you know, being a salesperson, which is, you know, the, your competitors are also good salespeople also have products and services that bring value to them and potentially have a better relationship, um, you know, which is something that you need to overcome. So, you know, it's going to be a, a myriad of those things that I, I would say that would benefit. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just one of those things you're going to take else, you know, it's just a, a normal part of the business. Um, you just got to stay competitive and continue to work, um, you know, on selling those customers. And you know what? And, and a lot of times, if, if you've got a great relationship, they'll tell you exactly why you didn't win that RFQ or that bid or their business. Um, you know, it could be customer service, could be something that you have no absolutely zero control over. Um, you know, because you're representing a company. So it could be, you know, customer service, it could be product quality. These are all things that you need to internalize, you know, take back to your company, uh, and then try to work through. But again, um, you know, it's just a part of the business. So it's, uh, it, it gets hard when you start, but it'll get it'll get easier as you go along. There's, there's a question that keeps popping up about uh, a few times, and it just did again, making sure that we saw it. It looks like, uh, you know, many of us, I think all three of us talked about starting out in sales, but, um, you know, having the opportunity to maybe move other directions and, and what kind of motivated us um, to do that. And again, I'm going to go back to just, I think, starting out in sales, and I'm sure Zach's experienced this and Adeline's experiencing it for sure right now you just get exposure to so many other departments because when you're in sales, you, you just inherently, when you're working for your customer on your customer's behalf, um, you're problem solving and, and you're involved. And it, it probably was, you know, just a few years in um, where, you know, I realized, geez, I, I really may want to run a business one day. I'd love to be a general manager or, or a president or, or, or even more at some point if, if given the, the opportunity. And I think sales certainly prepared me for that. But ultimately, you know, how did I end up getting that level? I, I, I knew business was where I wanted to be and, and eventually uh, pursued an MBA. Um, but while pursuing that MBA, I was very open to other opportunities. And, and you know, I, it, it can be scary at time to move out of sales and go into operations or, or move into general management. Uh, but it was, it, 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 was, it was definitely worth it to me. But again, I don't see myself in the opportunity I'm in today or having these opportunities, if it wasn't uh, for my experience in, in sales initially. I, I feel very strongly about that, in fact. Yeah, and I'll, I'll back that up too. Sa sales, uh, again, is for me, I've been in it most of my career. I've done a couple marketing roles, but I just love the lifestyle that it allows me to live. Um, you know, and as I move up more into management, you know, looking to do what Jeff is doing and supporting a PL, uh, you know, the, the sales as a whole has just allowed me to live a, a, just a great lifestyle. You know, I don't have to be behind a computer all day. If I want to blow off on a Friday, if I've had a long week and go play some golf or just get out, I can do that. So there's not a lot of roles that allow you to do that on a Friday. There's also a lot of roles that mandate you go to an office. Um, you know, I work remotely. So, and I've done that my entire career. Uh, there's probably, I've had two roles where I've actually had to report to an office, but I decided that in my life and what I want to do, uh, that's not something that I'm willing to do right now, um, which allows me to kind of live that more freely. But, um, you know, when you get bound to an office, you're generally bound to which region uh, that they, that they need you to live in or where that office is. So, um, but 
again, I don't, I'm not married. Um, you know, I'm, I'm engaged. I don't have kids. So, you know, as I kind of progress more into my career, I'll most likely take an office job so I can be a little bit home, uh, you know, more, uh, a little bit more home, uh, as well as have a little bit more stability. Um, a lot of my travels overnight, I'm usually gone, you know, half the week. So, um, but, uh, you know, that's kind of been my career. I've definitely had yeah. the flexibility to golf. I think um, at the end of the question, it was at what point, what event made you feel like you were ready to, for something else? I think you just know, you just got to trust your gut. You'll feel it and go for whatever you, you want, your passion or you like, or you're interested in getting to learn more about. You know, that, my that's good advice, that. Adeline. And I, I think you, you, one important thing I think to, to share with those on the phone, getting ready to graduate, thinking about these opportunities, it gets real easy to start thinking too far ahead. And, you know, what job do I want next year? And then what job does that lead me to in three? And one piece of advice I want to give you is master the job that you're in. Learn everything about it. Try to master that job. And you're going to get exposed to other areas of the business. And Adeline's exactly right. You're going to know when you feel like you could be passionate about something, something else. And I just urge you, when you're there, speak up and take a leap of faith if you get that, uh, you get that opportunity. Yeah, I, I agree with that as well. I mean, it's you'll know. I mean, uh, you know, for me, I I pivoted out. I pivoted right back in. You know, I left and did product management, uh, global product management for almost two years, um, but it was a job that was behind a desk. It, it was uh, P&L support. So I managed the whole product line for us. Um, and it just wasn't something that I, that I loved, um, you know, and I knew that I loved sales. So I, I did pivot right back in when I got the opportunity. Like I said, you'll know when you know, um, you know, just keep working at it. You know, it's always good to have a plan, but as Jeff said, you know, you you know, your plans will always change. Things will always change. Your life will always change. You might meet somebody and, and move to Denver. Who knows? You know, I was teasing you about the golf. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I wanted to elaborate on that a bit. I mean, I think it's great that, and you're right, sales does provide some flexibility. And you do get the opportunity to entertain and, uh, and do some fun things. And again, if I was to give some more advice and I might continue, I'm the oldest on the panel, by the way, so I get to, um, you know, we need that in, in, in all of our jobs. I think we've definitely, I have learned that over this last year. Um, it's easy to get absorbed in work and feel like you need to be there at six in, in the morning and, and, and there till five o'clock at night. Um, but the fact is you do have to have some flexibility to have some fun and, and some free time and, uh, you know, that's something that I think as we look at transitioning back into the to the office, we're going to be a little bit more thoughtful about providing those flexible work hours and the ability to get out and do other things when they need to. People can be productive. We have more access to technology than ever before. So it's easy to stay plugged in even when you're not sitting behind your computer at the office, I should say. I saw there was a question on research and analytics and how they play into your sales experience. So I leverage research and data uh, almost every day. Um, you know, we, we leverage a lot of that in, in the work that we do uh, just simply around the, uh, the data for the vehicles that we're running and how customers look at that data and make that data actionable. So, uh, you know, it's it, a lot of the customers that we have, it's, it's very, um, like I said, it's a, it's a relationship, you know, it's a partnership. So we, we do leverage data every day to help support in our sales cycles, to help support in their businesses. Um, and it's the reason why they ended up inevitably make their decision. So, um, but again, that's just a, a part of our business. Some businesses are very different, but, you know, around what we do, the, the purchasers that we work with are, are really know their business up and down. So um, it, it, you know, it, it could be, uh, you know, the fuel economy, it could be, you know, how the trucks operate, it could be downtime. I mean, uh, there is just a ton of data that goes into the procurement side of the business, which we have to match that and sell to it. Um, so again, it's, uh, it's very useful. And I would recommend if you get the opportunity to leverage data uh, and, and work on how you can, how can you leverage pivot tables and Excel and all that good stuff, 
Um, data is going to be a very big is a big part of sales, and data continues to be a big part of uh, of everything that we do. So, yeah, on the research and analytics, that's pretty much what I do day to day with my salespeople. So I'm in charge of the East Grocery Channel of four customers, and we basically research, you know, what price points are, you know, the hot spot or like where people are more prone to buy. We'll run a promotion and then we'll analyze it after the, you know, after the promotion ran and just see how it performed. Um, we'll compare it to our competitors. So, I mean, that's a big part of the business. And I'm always doing this, you know, with my sales partner, with my sales, you know, manager. Great points by both of you. I can tell you that we have an analytics department that we put in place at Worthington you know, roughly five years ago, a lot of analysts within the, within the business, but Adeline, your, your point on, it's just, you're trying to be as fact-based as possible when we're making investments in capacity, equipment, what products we want to launch. And I think, you know, voice of customer and gathering the analytics there, willingness to pay, those are all critical components that you need to think through before you're ready to, to move on with a, a product launch. Um, so definitely, has been critical. I see it even being more critical moving forward. Yeah. And no two customers are the same. So like there's different price points within all of our customers and our grocery channels. So it's critical for us to analyze and research each one and understand them, their market. Would you like to share some of the uh, most exciting and what most not exciting experiences, some specific things, if you don't mind, maybe students can, can see that everybody faces a different situation, different things in their career. Yeah, I, I guess I'll give most exciting, I might give a most exciting something in sales, if it's okay, and least exciting something that wasn't in, in sales. Um, probably, you know, throughout my career, probably the most exciting, and I think Zach will appreciate this, is uh, when I was a territory manager outside sales, uh, living in the state of Iowa, um, I, I and our team landed the John Deere account, which is uh, still one of our largest accounts today. It was an account we had been trying for decades um, to get into, and that took um, our team two years and ultimately I'll, I'll go somewhere with this. I promise. Um, it wasn't as easy as us just getting in and providing the solution that our competitor was already providing. We were able to come in and completely change the supply chain. We were able to have John Deere take out equipment, which was a huge working capital save. Um, but that took us again, two years to build the trust and, and the relationship to come up with that proposal. Uh, but that was certainly something very exciting to me. And, and again, they're a very uh, great customer uh, today. And then, you know, I, I think as I moved on from sales and, and, and something that, that might not be one of my most favorite, you know, experiences was having to walk into a, a facility, a factory of a couple hundred people to let them know that we no longer had enough business to, to, to continue operating in, in that area. And uh, unfortunately, as hard as we would try to, to source new opportunities for them, uh, it just wasn't going to be possible. Um, those, are, those are tough and, and you know, brutal, brutal conversations to have to have. Fortunately, we're doing well now and we're going to be adding facilities and growing and I don't want to have any more of those discussions. I think I was thinking of the challenging, not only exciting, but the challenging uh, situations that, that you faced. Uh, I didn't say it properly, probably. Yeah, I can start off with a super challenging one. I mean, COVID-19 um, has been wildly challenging um, and not in the, in, the, in the ways that most would think. Um, it's you know, as you're as you work at sales and you travel and you visit customers, what you don't realize is some of the challenges that those folks are dealing with. So my boss, for example, you know, has four kids and they weren't going to school. 
So he was having to not only manage, uh, you know, a, a team of salespeople, but also uh, have to manage teaching his kids, uh, you know, or working with his kids at home um, on top of just the, the general challenges that have come with COVID in regards to our business and the supply chains that have been so disrupted because of it. So, um, so that has been, I think, overall, the, the most challenging thing that I've had to work through, which is dealing with people uh, personally, uh, you know, that have challenges and things at home that they're dealing with that you just wouldn't run into every day on top of some of the supply chain challenges. And, you know, Jeff had mentioned it, you know, a lot of companies had layoffs, especially like this summer. So, you know, I had to see a lot of my colleagues go um, in the uh, July timeframe as we, we did have a, a pretty large round of layoffs. So, um, so that, those are probably some of the most challenging things that, that you've had to work through, but it's the cyclicality of business, um, which is going to be, you know, there's going to be ebbs and flows. Businesses are going to grow or contract. So, uh, you know, it's just a, a, a natural churn in business. So, you know, we just have to deal with it. I just haven't dealt with much like that uh, and hopefully not having to deal with much of, uh, of COVID, uh, hopefully after, uh, you know, the vaccines get through and we reopen. So um, for me, one of the, the greatest things has just been landing a large account. Um, for example, PepsiCo, I, I was doing a Six Sigma project a couple of years ago for PepsiCo, um, have leveraged a lot of data, worked through one of our suppliers, and we ended up landing a, a good portion of their parts account, uh, which took a lot of time and effort. But again, um, you know, it's, it's that growing relationships and continuing to push on it. And, and again, big businesses like that are always looking for partners. So, uh, you know, for me, that was probably the most successful that I've had was, was the PepsiCo account. And that, uh, that's been a, a relationship that I've grown for 10 years uh, at, at various companies, mind you. Uh, you know, I've worked for four different major companies that have all been suppliers to Pepsi. And I've been able to carry over those relationships year after year. Still the same buyers, still the same folks that are working around the same. Some of them have moved well up into management. So, um, but again, great longstanding relationships. And it, it's good to be a part of, a, uh, you know, be a part of a commercial team that sells to large customers like that, where you can leverage those relationships uh, forever. Now you need Adeline to get on the ball and get you into Gatorade. <laughs> It's the same truck that moves all of our stuff. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I have the same as Zach Low and, you know, greatest or highlight. My highlight is the relationships that I've made with some of my salespeople. Um, definitely friendships, like Jeff had mentioned. And my challenge, my biggest challenge has been COVID, the supply constraints and the pricing and all of that that's been around COVID has been a nightmare, but hopefully it's it's silver sometime soon. Uh, before the, the last question, uh, the sales, uh, Jeff and Zach, I'm in my sales class, I'm using the Challenger sales book as a reading book. Uh, they do presentations. I don't know if you have seen that the book, The Challenger uh, Sales. Uh, it's very, very good book that, that that one of the students recommended, the former students started in the sales area. He played football as well, uh, but he graduated about five years ago and he was dating my neighbor's daughter. She was a student as well. He said, Professor Pinar, we are using this book and I recommend you. And I think that was a, uh, I will have to recommend the Challenger Sales. It's a little old to have a new edition type, but it is a very, very good book that they did. The, and then a uh, couple of students got a sales job um, and that offer and May to get a package from the company. They opened up the books. One of them was a challenger sales book. It's a professor for now we are using, they're asking me to read the book. I already read it, you know. And one of the sent me an email and said she got the job out of 20 people because she mentioned that she read the sales challenger book and, and mentioned a few things from that. So they, they, it's kind of a nice book that I like to mention. I don't know uh, uh, if you if you have seen that. But they are asking about future suggestions, career things, and, and uh, since we are getting about, about 10 minutes to go, I'd uh, like to hear your recommendations and things uh, that, that students can take away. One of my recommendations for you know, preparing for the world of work would definitely be be open-minded and willing to learn. Um, 
it's okay to not have all the answers. Just be willing to, you know, put the effort in to find out. Yeah, I, I'll probably back on that a little bit. Um, you know, I would say absolutely, especially if you want to find a role in sales, be open. Um, and I would say be open to relocating, be open to, to moving around to trying new challenges, to be out of your comfort zone, um, you know, because you're going to inevitably be out of your comfort zone, especially trying to learn, uh, you know, a new skill, uh, know what it's like to be dealing with customers, um, and then find a good, find a good uh, a mentor to have along the way. Um, I've been blessed in my career to have people that have really helped me um, in my company, out of my company, uh, professionals that have really kind of helped support in that. Um, so I would say, you know, definitely get out of your comfort zone. If you're, if you're looking for good employment, be open to moving, be open to moving all over the country. It doesn't have to be, you know, it, it doesn't have to be forever. It could be a year, it could be two years. Um, but I know a lot of people that have, have decided to not look for certain opportunities that they might have really enjoyed because they were unwilling to leave a, a state or an area, uh, you know, to get their career started. So I would say, you know, definitely, you know, uh, shoot for the moon. So, you know, good, all good answers, open minded, be ready to collaborate, um, be ready to share opinions, be ready to, to listen to other opinions. And I'm going to go back to do not get too far ahead of yourselves. I see so many um, young and, and eager and, and smart folks come out of the college and, and, and join the workforce. And, you know, a couple months in, they're, they're already asking their manager, what's next? And again, you know, stay focused, master your job, learn as much as you possibly can. Talk to the veterans, you know, learn, learn the products. And if you're performing, you know, people will find you. you know, they'll see you. Good managers will they'll tap you on their on your shoulder. And you talked about, you know, when will I know I'm ready? You'll know, you'll feel it, but somebody else more than likely will. You'll have a mentor or somebody that's going to see that you're ready to move on, and uh, and they're going to help you help you do that. So just urge you to be to be patient. And then, you know, as you prepare for the workforce, or even when you're in the workforce, just always continue to to try to learn and, and, and take yourself out of your comfort zone. And, and one thing I always highly recommend um, to anybody is, is reading. I mean, it's just like practicing if, if you wanna play piano or if you're a basketball player, if you wanna be a good salesperson or you wanna you aspire for that career, read some sales books. If it's really leadership that excites you, then read a lot of leadership books and pay attention to what people are doing really well and just as important, if you run across a situation where you think someone didn't handle it really well, file that in your bank as well, because that can be just as helpful. But that's, that's some advice I would give. I guess we're about uh, getting to the end. Uh, kind of last round of suggestions, recommendations uh, that students can, can, can take away. But I mean, three of you mentioned learning. I saw somewhere people cannot earn more than what they learn. I mean, cannot earn more than what they learn. I mean, the learning is a, is a key indicator of uh, their, uh, their earning power. I mean, there are exceptions, of course, but these are shortcuts will get you in, a, in trouble. Uh, and, and I also saw somewhere that the learning should be equal to or more than a change happening around you. So all of you, three of you indicated learning and then uh, the last thing that, that they may want to take a, uh, take away uh, from your presentations, your experience. Yeah, I would say, you know, sales, sales has a lot of opportunities. I mean, you can be a hunter, uh, you know, a, a sales professional, just straight sales. You can be an account manager, which could be more farming. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunities that, you know, that you could have going into a sales type role. And, and to be quite honest with you, they're very rewarding. Uh, you know, just like in a lot of professions, if you're a top performer, uh, you know, you're going to do quite well uh, and companies find value in it. Um, you know, you have to you have to be good. You got to think on your feet. Uh, you know, Jeff hit the nail on the head. I mean, you've got to be very well rounded in order to do any type of role at a high level. And sales is just one of them. So, you know, as long as you're continuing to want to learn. Um, and if you're interested in sales, it's a great profession. 
um, it, it's something I, I'm, I'm just so fortunate to have had done uh, right out of college and decided that, you know, had found, had found what my niche was right out of college, which was, you know, working in marketing and sales. Uh, you know, I might be, I might take some other roles here and there, um, you know, as I progress through my career, but, you know, sales is, is where I enjoy it. And, and I hope to run a sales, a very large sales team at some point in my career. And that's, that's, those are my goals and aspirations because I want to manage people that were like me. Uh, which were driven, hardworking, and, and enjoy being in front of the customer. Yeah, if I'm thinking specific to, to, to sales, I guess some, some last words. Um, again, Zach mentioned this, this earlier, and, and certainly there is something to be said for being a professional salesman. And there's certain, you know, you're going to learn a lot in classes and learn how to build the trust and approach customers and present but I think equally important to be a very successful salesperson, again, I'll go back to really get in and learn your operations, really understand quality and, and what they do. Spend time with folks like Adeline that are behind the pricing and the analytics. Understand what makes a, an item profitable and what does not. Um, those are crucial and, and I think critical to separating yourselves um, from others. And any, any recommendation from your background, your field, your area of work? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, you know, what Jeff said and what I said earlier, just being open-minded and not rushing to the next role, you know, just try to master your role or really like get everything you can out of it. Um, before taking off because you can really be creative once you understand it and implement efficiencies. And that's really beneficial and that's where, you know, people will notice you. So take your time, crawl before you run. Well, uh, really, I'd like to thank you, three of you, and I learned a lot. I'm sure also students will benefit this recorded. Uh, and I always remember Zach sending me email from Germany, Professor, for now we're traveling. I cannot send my assignment. Can I send it later? I said, sure, Zach, have fun in Germany, in Europe. And I think that was, I always remember, but I now connect the name and, 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 and the emails that I'm glad that I got to talk to you and I'm really happy that you are doing well. And all of you as well, so Jeff was before my time, but Valpo, Adeline, we didn't have you, but you can always come here <laughs> to talk to us, our students. I'd like to thank uh, all three of you. That was very beneficial. And I learned, uh, especially from our sales class, but every class, and I really appreciate and thank you for your time and effort that, that you share your experience with our students. Well, thank you as well. Thank I think this you. is great that Valparaiso is, is, uh, is, is doing this. Just a great, great format. Um, I learned a lot as well. Zach, Adeline, great to meet you. And uh, it's very clear why you two are, are so successful in, in your job. So it was a pleasure being on the panel with both of you. From the Likewise. Careers. From the Career Center, thank you very much to all of you. Musa, thank you for moderating. We really appreciate it. Uh, we know you're busy and have other things going on. Um, students, keep in mind that we have more panels coming up this month. Uh, check Instagram at Valpo Careers to see all the details. And thank you again, everyone. Have a great evening. Let us know how we can help you. <laughs>